All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Leitner Observatory uh, Tuesday night live stream. I'm out here on the observing deck, uh, waving at the deck camera, <laughs> the internet deck camera. Let me switch over to the camera in front of me. It's pretty dark out here. Um, hey, there we go. <laughs> it's pretty dark out here. It's going to get darker. I forgot to bring in my uh, fast lens that lets me look a little better when I'm uh, uh, doing videos and streaming out here in the dark of night. Uh, I thought uh, this afternoon it was beautiful and I thought, oh, it's going to be uh, warm enough that when I do a public night live stream, I could go outside to the deck and set up a couple of telescopes uh, and have a nice view of the sky. It's a little chilly though, and I wasn't quite prepared. I didn't bring a, <laughs> a warm enough coat, <laughs> um, but I'm okay. I've got my, uh, my cup of hot tea right here. Um, and I'm a little bit in the dark, but uh, I think you can kind of see me. And I have two telescopes set up. Uh, actually, you can see them a little bit better uh, in the deck cam. Let me switch back to, if I could do it, Leah, switch back to the deck cam. So here's the 12 inch telescope that I usually use and the video camera that I usually have a live view of. And then over there, I actually have a, um, a three and a half inch ref uh, refractor setup on another equatorial mount, which I was thinking about demonstrating a live view through the camera, um, but I don't know if I want to disconnect my camera while I'm streaming and try and hook it up to the telescope, by which I mean take the lens off and put it on the telescope. So I don't know, I think we'll have some interesting things to look at um, with the 12 inch telescope. It's a really uh, nice night. It's not perfectly clear, but it's mostly clear. Um, it's not perfectly clear, but it's mostly clear. And the beautiful first quarter moon up right at this moment. And I have the video camera on the 12 inch telescope pointed at the moon right now. So let me just show you what that looks like. I'll put up the live view. So here we have a live view of the moon right now. And I don't know, prove it's live. I could bump the telescope, I guess. I'll tap, tap, tap. <laughs> you see the image jump around. Uh, it's a little bit windy, so the image will be jumping around uh, a little bit. I could move the telescope using uh, the telescope controls here. Uh, let me actually do center it just a little bit better for you. All right, so we'll move down and a little bit left here. Uh, okay, how does that look now? Um, yeah, looks pretty good. Focus is okay. It's shaking around a little bit, uh, but I think it looks pretty good. Um, so I will uh, talk a little bit about what's up in the sky tonight and this week, and uh, a little bit of astronomy news, a little bit about what's going on at the observatory. Um, and uh, <laughs> then we'll take a look at a few interesting objects through the telescope. And if I'm feeling brave, I might try to point, I might try to point the, uh, the 90 millimeter, my little 90 millimeter telescope over there um, at the moon. And the point that I was uh, thinking about making with that is that that's a little telescope I bought uh, at the beginning of the quarant pandemic quarantine last year. So I'd have a telescope at home when I couldn't get into the observatory. Um, I could have taken home one of the observatory telescopes, but I wanted my own telescope. And it's a very inexpensive telescope, but you get really great views of star clusters and the moon and the planets. I did some live streams from my backyard last year around this time, uh, winds picking up. So uh, at some point I would like to put together a video of telescopes I think are good options if you're looking to buy a beginner's telescope for hundred dollars. That one actually cost two hundred dollars and came with a really nice mount and a set of lenses. So I think it's a it's a really good bargain. Um, if anyone has any questions for me as I'm giving you this tour, uh, please feel free to type your uh, questions, comments, whatever uh, in the chat. I uh, hope everyone's doing well tonight, uh, enjoying the spring weather. Uh, enjoying walking out uh, in nature and seeing the flowers and seeing uh, the blossoms on the trees. Uh, one of my favorite times of year. I've been trying to get out and go for a walk every day after lunch, uh, stretch my legs, <laughs> get some exercise, uh, get some vitamin D. 
uh, and uh, uh, enjoy, enjoy the spring. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to keep looking at the moon uh, for a little while. I could actually show you what it looks like in this camera. So you get sort of a wide view of it. So we can just pan up and take a look at the moon here. All right, so it's pretty much directly overhead. If I can get the, the uh, tripod to turn that far. All right, there we go. So a nice first quarter moon. Uh, you can maybe zoom in a little bit on it. Nice first quarter moon tonight. Brightest thing in the sky by far. And actually I can pan over here, show you what I'm looking at. There's the uh, 90 millimeter, three and a half inch telescope, my own telescope. Um, now the mount that it's on is a nice equatorial mount that we use for uh, labs here at the observatory. And then we've got downtown New Haven over there. Uh, a couple of people hanging out in the gardens, out in the park, enjoying the night. Uh, there's the uh, eight inch refractor dome over there. And I am over here next to the 12 inch telescope, uh, right here. All right. So let's uh, take a look at the sky calendar for tonight. All right, let me uh, switch over to the sky calendar. So here we are. Here's the skymaps.com sky calendar that I've shown a couple of times. And we're still on the uh, April map. So if we take a look at this, it looks just like it did last week and the week before. Um, and so you can see the bright stars and constellations that are up tonight. We're now getting into, uh, you know, we passed into late April, the second half of April. Um, so this is more like what the sky looks like around 9 p.m. rather than uh, 10 p.m. And uh, you never see the moon plotted on this plot because, of course, the moon moves every night, moving about uh, 13, 14 degrees uh, per night along the ecliptic. So for about two weeks, you see it crawling across the ecliptic in the evening sky until it gets to be full when it rises uh, at sunset. Uh, I can see Sirius low over there in the southwest. So that's one of the winter stars that's going down right at sunset right now. I really can't easily see any part of Orion, although I think I probably could see Betelgeuse if I were to go over and um, look carefully over the trees over there. Uh, I can see uh, that must be Procyon right there. So that's the bright star in Canis Minor. And can I still see Gemini? Oh yeah, I see Gemini just a little bit to the west or the sort of right if you're facing south and looking up at the moon. So uh, the moon tonight is right here. It's actually right next to uh, Cancer. It's in the constellation of Cancer. And it's near that little star cluster, the M44 Beehive star cluster that I look to, like to look at with a small telescope. And then Leo is more or less overhead. Oh yeah, I see Regulus uh, right there. Uh, we were looking at some galaxies last week in uh, Leo. And I'm looking for Arcturus. Oh yeah, I see Arcturus over in the east, um, just getting above the tree line above the eight inch uh, refractor telescope dome. Um, so in terms of planets, Mars is really kind of low and dim. It's quite far away. Uh, if we were to look with, look for it with the naked eye in just the right place. Okay. Yes. I see Mars. I see Mars over there. Uh, if you know where to look for it, you can find it and identify it, but there are a lot of other stars that are brighter. Aldebaran is brighter right now. Capella is brighter right now. Capella is behind the dome, uh, from where I'm sitting right now. And then uh, this time of year in late April through May, uh, the Big Dipper is high in the sky uh, about an hour after sunset. So I'm looking for the Big Dipper over in this direction. And I think there are more clouds over in that direction. Okay, wait, uh, 
I'm blocking the, the light a little bit. Yeah, okay, I see the Big Dipper. I'm gonna use my binoculars to look for it uh, a little more closely. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So it is a little bit hazy. It's a little bit more hazy over in that direction than it is to the south, but I clearly have the uh, seven stars in the Big Dipper just a little bit east of uh, overhead, a little bit north of directly overhead. Uh, so nice to see that. It's the right season. <laughs> In terms of uh, the calendar, uh, let's see here. In terms of the uh, calendar, so we have first quarter moon tonight, right? So it's uh, April 20th tonight. First quarter moon at 7 p.m. UT. So that was this afternoon, what, around uh, 3 p.m. or so. Um, and actually, yes, when you do look at the moon through the telescope, you can see it's a little bit more than half illuminated. We perfectly half illuminated right at exactly first quarter. Uh, moon near Beehive Cluster, yes, that's tonight. Uh, so I'm looking, <coughs> I'm looking at uh, the calendar over here on the left side of the star chart. Uh, uh, moon, uh, moon near Beehive Cluster, Lyrid Meteor Shower Peaks. Uh, so that's going to be Thursday night. The moon is going to be uh, two days past uh, uh, first quarter, so that's going to be a waxing gibbous moon. And so if you go out and look at the sky after midnight, you'll definitely see some meteors in the uh, Lyrid meteor shower, and the moon should have set by then. So if you're someplace where the sky is really dark, you'll see quite a few meteors. Uh, 10 to 20 bright, fast meteors per hour. That's pretty good. So go out for a half hour, you should see uh, 5 to 10 bright, fast meteors. Uh, not looking great for clear weather on Thursday night, but you never know. Uh, I think if it's clear, I'll go out at midnight and see if I see any meteors. And uh, once I've counted uh, <laughs> two or three bright meteors, I'll probably go back inside. Uh, now, uh, in terms of constellations over here in the eastern part of the sky, we're getting Spica and Arcturus, uh, the bright star in Bootes, getting higher in the sky. So do I see Spica? I see Arcturus right there. And yeah, I see Spica right there behind my uh, little telescope uh, over there. Uh, and then uh, what I think of as a late spring constellation, Libra, is coming up. Now, the stars in Libra are not super bright, um, but when Libra is higher in the sky, um, about two months or so at sunset, Libra is higher in the sky. You can definitely see the brightest stars uh, in Libra. Uh, Zubanel Ganubi and Zubanesh Shamali, two of my favorite uh, star names. Also on the star map, you can see what astronomers call the ecliptic. So this is the plane of the solar system uh, across the sky. So you see this dotted line. Uh, really, it's the plane of the Earth's orbit projected up into space. And so the sun, as the Earth orbits around the sun, the sun's going to creep along uh, the ecliptic. Um, and uh, since all of the planets orbit in nearly the same plane, and the moon orbits in that, around the Earth in that same plane, um, we always see the sun and the moon and the naked eye planets kind of close to that line. So we think of these constellations along the ecliptic as special uh, constellations. These are constellations of the zodiac. And it's actually useful to use these stars and these constellations to uh, report the positions of the planets and the sun and the moon over time. Uh, so you can keep track of them for whatever uh, purpose you may have. Uh, okay, looking forward to getting the May chart next week uh, and seeing what events are coming in May. Uh, and besides Mars, the other naked eye planets are up in the morning sky. So Venus is actually behind the sun right now. It's kind of coming around the back of the sun right now. Same with Mercury. They're both kind of coming around the back of the sun. And then Jupiter and Saturn are quite bright uh, in the morning sky at dawn. So if you're an early riser or someone who stays up late, <laughs> you can uh, look to the east just before sunrise and see uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, I could demo those in the sky simulator in my planetarium software, but I think uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Mars mission, right? I've been talking about this uh, now and then. Uh, leading up to this flight, the Perseverance mission leading up to the flight of the Ingenuity helicopter. So that flight was uh, yesterday morning and very, very exciting that this worked. There's some amazing uh, video out there, video taken. It's just amazing that we have this video at all from the surface of Mars. Video taken by the Perseverance rover of the Ingenuity helicopter taking off. Here it goes. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, now, the uh, atmosphere is so incredibly thin uh, on Mars that 1% you know, the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, 1% per essentially the density, that uh, these helicopter blades are pretty large for a rover, for a probe. It's about a meter, there are two of them that are about a meter across, uh, made of carbon fiber. Uh, carbon fiber. They're spinning very fast, uh, two rotors in opposite directions, uh, and the rover, uh, the helicopter itself is very, very light. So uh, uh, it's just four pounds. <laughs> so um, the wind is light, not surprisingly, uh, and it's able to lift itself up for uh, about a minute, minute and a half or so. So the first flight was for 39 seconds. Uh, there are going to be more flights. And the idea is that this is um, able to do some scouting around the rover um, and also to be a engineering proof of concept so that in the future uh, rovers, missions to Mars uh, could potentially use this technology to again scout Mars. Um, I think it would also be amazing to have a glider uh, on Mars or some kind of fixed wing uh, aircraft, um, something with really long wings that could potentially catch thermals on Mars. Um, I used to do paragliding, uh, <laughs> you know, related to hang gliding, and uh, you want to be able to catch rising air so that you can stay aloft. And there are certainly thermals on Mars. We see the dust devils on Mars that are evidence uh, of thermals. So uh, that would be really interesting if there could be an autonomous glider that could stay aloft for, who knows, a few hours uh, on Mars and uh, do a, a, an aerial survey around Mars. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else I want to say about that. I'm looking, really looking forward to future flights, and I'm really uh, happy for the JPL team that, that risked this. You know, big risk to put this rover on Mars and to put this helicopter on Mars because, of course, everyone was anticipating um, the results of this uh, test flight. Uh, okay, so let's uh, take a look at the moon again through the telescope. And there are a couple things I think I want to say about the view of the moon. So I'm gonna switch back to my live view here. So um, I had the moon more or less centered in the view of the telescope here um, 10 minutes ago, and it's drifted off. And the reason why is that the telescope mount is rotating to counteract, counteract the rotation of the Earth. So the Earth is turning that way to the east, um, 360 degrees per 24 hours. And so the telescope is turning the other way uh, at the same rate to stay focused on one part of the sky, one part of the distant universe as the Earth rotates the other way. Now, the moon is also orbiting the Earth. So the moon has moved to the left <laughs> relative to the direction that we're facing in a few minutes, in 10 minutes or so since I got it centered. Now, it would be possible, possible for me to program the telescope mount to track at the rate of the moon but I can just nudge the image over. Let me do that here. I can show you what I'm doing here. So I'm gonna bring up the, um, here's, the uh, here's the telescope control software. And I'm gonna go in here and nudge the telescope to the left a little bit. All right, and how's that looking? Let's get that out of the way. A little bit, I'll go a little bit further here. So nudge a little bit more to the left and a little bit down. I'm kind of uh, artificially tracking the moon as the moon is orbiting around the Earth. Um, I could actually measure the rate at which the moon is moving and potentially figure out what the orbit of the moon is. That's kind of a fun project um, <laughs> in historical astronomy. Yeah. Okay. Look at these amazing uh, craters and mountain ranges uh, on the moon. Actually, I'm going to even go over a bit more because I want to get those mountain ranges in view. Let's see here. Yeah. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. So, um, People are, assume that the moon has no color, but there is actually some color here, and I don't know if I can get any of it to appear. Maybe if I really increase the saturation. Yeah, you can see there's a little bit of a color difference between this Maria and this Maria. Um, 
So the very subtle colors on the surface of the moon are related to the geochemistry uh, of the particles on the moon. And it actually tells you a bit about the history of which impacts hap happen when, uh, when. Because um, when an impact on the moon happens, there'll be ejecta thrown out over the regol regolith of the moon. Um, and you can uh, see very subtle colors uh, between uh, the different chemical compositions of the different ejecta. So um, this is uh, Tranquility Sea, Maria, uh, uh, what is it, Tranquilis? Uh, and this is the Serenity Sea up here. And you can see Tranquility Sea is definitely a slightly subtle color difference. Something else that's interesting about this live video that I'm getting is that as we're looking at it, you can definitely see the shimmering of the Earth's atmosphere, right? So we're getting an image about every half second or so. Um, I'm going to bring the saturation back down so it's a bit sharper. Um, <laughs> we're getting an image about every half second or so. And you can see some of the images are sharper um, because there'll be just a moment in time, a fraction of a second, when the atmosphere is steady. And those rays from that part of the moon that are being focused by the telescope can make a sharp image. But maybe there's a cell of turbulence right next to it. So there's kind of this roiling and boiling of the atmosphere um, that you see. Uh, this is fairly typical of the turbulence that we see um, in New Haven from the Leitner Observatory. Um, sometimes I've seen it better, often I've seen it worse. <laughs> um, if we were on top of a mountain, some distant mountain observatory, uh, we'd have a much sharper view. Let me actually enlarge the image a little bit for you. Just make it just a little bit bigger here. There we go. Move myself out of the way here. Um, now, in terms of what's going on here in the moon, one of the very rewarding things you can do uh, as um, an amateur astronomer getting started and with a small three and a half inch telescope or with your pair of binoculars is learn some of the main features of the moon. Um, and so it's worth getting a good lunar map. Um, you can buy them online uh, where the major geological features, the craters and the mountain ranges and the maria, um, some of the rills uh, are labeled. Uh, you can also find this information online. So actually, if I go to, let me go to a moon map here. Let's see here. There's actually um, <laughs> Google's moon map. <laughs> so I'm sure you know about maps.google.com. You can also go to moon.google.com. And Google has put a high resolution image of the moon surface in Google. And you can scroll around and zoom in on features. And it's fun, but it's also not great uh, for viewing the moon and learning about the features on the moon just because um, the, uh, the map is flat, right? So if I zoom out a lot, there's a lot of distortion. <laughs> giant craters at the poles because we're taking a sphere and flattening it out. And then also they don't have anything labeled. So you still need a moon map <laughs> in order to see things. So there's a really good um, moon map from the uh, USGS, uh, right? So the, um, uh, the geography service, the US Ge geography service. And uh, these, this comes from an orbiter of the moon, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LR, LRO orbiter. Um, and I downloaded one of the maps here so you can see here's some of it. And so, yeah, we can identify some of these craters in Maria. So Maria Seri, Serenitatis, <laughs> the, the, sea, the Sea of uh, Serenity. Mare Tranquillitatis, so Latin, the, the Sea of Tranquility. So the Apollo 11, uh, 11 landing is actually right here at sort of the um, southwest edge of the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, and we can see that in this image. If I switch back to the uh, image, the live image here. All right, so uh, let's zoom in on that. All right, let's zoom in a little bit. All right, so we're looking, basically the Apollo 11 landings are sort of right in here. So we can see that crater and that crater. 
which in uh, maybe I should put the moon map up at the same time. <laughs> um, let me switch back to the moon map. Yeah, so uh, I can definitely, I can definitely see that big crater and that big crater in the live image. I think it's that big crater and that big crater. So the Apollo 11 landings are right there. Now, sometimes uh, when I'm showing a view of the moon through one of the telescopes on public night, a nice clear night like this, um, people will say, oh, can you see any artifacts? Can you see the lunar lander? Can you see uh, the flag that the astronauts planted on the moon? Can you see the footprints of the Apollo astronauts? L clearly, there's nothing there. <laughs> Clearly, we have just proved that the moon landings were faked uh, because we look at the surface of the moon where they say the Apollo 11 astronauts landed uh, and there's nothing there. Uh, no, of course, we don't have nearly a, enough sharpness <laughs> to see that. Now, in the LRO maps, you can actually see the lunar landers, the descent stages of the... Um, how many uh, landers were there on the moon? There was 11, 12, 13, famously didn't make it. 14, 15, 16, 17. So there are five, um, five landers uh, on the moon, uh, the, the descent stage. And in the lunar reconnaissance orbiters, there is enough resolution. You can see them, you can see uh, the footprints, you can see the instruments that were left behind uh, by the Apollo astronauts to study the moon. But we don't have nearly enough resolution. So if I zoom out, the entire moon is like 3,000 something miles across. And you know these individual pixels in my camera, each one is probably uh, at least 100 miles, actually maybe more like 50 miles. Um, <laughs> and so these smallest craters that we can resolve are tens of, or tens of miles across, right? These smallest detail details. So it'd be kind of like um, uh, looking at a picture of the Earth and maybe seeing a, a dot that represents New Haven <laughs> and asking, can I see my house there? Can I see the swimming pool in my backyard? No, we don't have nearly enough resolution. And actually see the wind is shaking the telescope, making it a little bit uh, blurry. All right, well, the moon is looking great tonight. I'm actually going to uh, zoom, move a little bit further to the left and a little bit further south to show some of the really cratered south polar region. So let me do that. So we'll move to the left a little bit, get more of the dark side of the moon centered there. We'll go down a little bit so we can see a little bit more of the um, South Pole region. Uh, that's looking pretty good. When the moon is at first quarter phase, crescent or first quarter phase, really nice to look out through a telescope um, because you see a lot of relief, right? You see a lot of shadows. And it's actually kind of astonishing how deep some of these craters are and how tall some of these mountains are over here. Um, there's a, an experiment sometimes we do, I do in some of my astronomy classes, where we measure the lengths of the shadows on the moon. And doing a little bit of astronomy and geometry, we can figure out the angle of the sun to that feature on the surface of the moon. How high would the moon be above the horizon? Um, right here is the line between night and day on the moon, the, the terminator, the, the where you would see the moon setting or rising if you were in that particular place. Since the moon is waxing at this part of its phase, becoming more illuminated, you would see the moon rising if you were to stand um, at that on that line uh, between night and day on the moon. Keep moving down a little bit further. Okay, so now we're seeing really the south pole of the moon. And look at those craters on top of craters, very deep craters. Um, one of these is Shackleton. Uh, let's see if it's on the moon map here. I would have to, I think, go get the other, I would have to go get the other, oh, there's Tsiolkovsky right there. I would have to go download the other moon map um, to point out which one is which. Um, and these are, these are deep craters at the poles that have evidence of water ice uh, buried deep in them. 
Uh, so very interesting. Uh, if we ever send um, uh, people to uh, the moon to, to gather resources on the moon, some of the things we might want would be iron from the moon to build spaceships to go further out. Uh, helium-3, which could potentially be a, a, a fuel source in the future for fusion reactors. And of course, for everything, we need water. For making oxygen, we need water. For surviving, we need water. Wow, here's a really nice rill uh, right here through this part of, uh, of the moon in the southern polar region. I, we probably can see that, but I'm not sure I can identify it quickly. Oh, I think this is it here. I think this is it here. Yeah, and then there's these cliffs over here. Uh, really nice. It's, uh, it's fun to uh, look at the moon with your eye uh, to an eyepiece. And uh, oh, you see the moon, right? One thing uh, that's also kind of fun is to um, uh, watch the moon for 10, 20 minutes or so uh, over the course, when it's first quarter or uh, crescent, and watch the sun start to hit the up far edge of these craters along the Terminator line, the line between night and day. Um, it's really quite amazing. Uh, anyway, so a fun thing to do is to look at the moon with your eye through the eyepiece of a small telescope, have a red flashlight, have a moon map, go in and orient yourself and sort of learn the major features. Um, the Copernicus crater, the, T the Tycho crater, uh, here's a really interesting overlapping crater right here. There are also a few interesting features where you can see it was clear there was a chain of meteoroids that hit the moon because you'll see a few small craters in a row and it's really clear that there was a collision or there was a chain uh, of, of uh, crater of objects that hit the moon. Okay, uh, let's see if there's any questions in the chat before we move to a different object. Anyone have any questions about the moon or my telescope or my camera? Are what's going on tonight? Any particular part of the moon that you really want to see through the 12 inch telescope? Looks really nice today. I would say this is slightly better than average view of the moon from the Leitner Observatory tonight. Okay, so um, I also think it would be fun to look at some star clusters and maybe a galaxy. Um, because it is galaxy season and the Virgo cluster is right there uh, and the uh, M51 galaxy is right there and the M101 galaxy is right there. Um, I took some pictures of M51 not last week but the week before um, and they weren't great because I wasn't I, I didn't have the telescope well focused and I wasn't getting a lot of stars um, so I think we get some better galaxy images tonight, although it's not perfectly clear. Uh, look again over this part of the sky. It's not perfectly clear, but it's clear enough I can see some bright stars. So it's definitely willing to try it out. Let's first look at a star cluster here. So I'm going to switch over to my telescope control. And um, let's see. Um, actually, let me, instead of the telescope control, let me switch over to my planetarium program here and kind of scan around, see if there's anything uh, that I want to point out. So we'll turn on the constellation lines and labels so you can see what's up. I'm looking at the moon right now, and yeah, you can see the moon is right next to Cancer, and the Beehive star cluster would be right there. We could nudge the telescope over and take a quick look at the Beehive, but uh, some light pollution from the moon there right next to it. Um, and it's kind of a big star cluster, but actually I think that's a good idea. Let's nudge it over and look at the Beehive cluster. Um, there's two Beehive clusters. <laughs> Which one is the real Beehive cluster? I don't know, that's not the Beehive cluster. Let's uh, nudge, it over and, nudge it over and take a look at the Beehive Cluster, and then I think we'll move over and maybe take a look at maybe M101, I think, tonight, over here in the Big Dipper. And it might be interesting, actually, to take a look at the M3 Globular Cluster. Yeah, it's, it's up there. It's above the horizon. Um, so 
let's, let's nudge over to the beehive cluster and uh, see how it looks tonight. So we're going to move over to M44, the beehive, right next to where we're pointing. <laughs> so let's nudge over. and uh, bring back the live image. All right, I'm gonna need a longer exposure. Try one second exposure here. Hey, there it is. Try a couple more, a little bit longer. Make it look a little bit brighter. I'm not quite exactly centered on the star cluster. I think I'm a little bit below it, but there is part of it. I recognize that triangle, and uh, doesn't look too uh, doesn't look too bad even with the light pollution. Let me nudge the telescope over just a little bit. Hey, there's more of the cluster. So the beehive, nice little star cluster, relatively close to us, easy to see with a small telescope or a binoculars. Um, you can even see it with the naked eye for some place where the sky is really dark. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jewel has a question about the telescope in the East Dome. Uh, what refurbishments were made to it in 2004? And what's the difference that you can observe pre and post refurb? Um, yeah, in the East Dome. So we have two permanently mounted telescopes here. There's an eight inch refractor in the East Dome and a 16 inch reflector in the West Dome over here behind me. And the refractor that's in the East Dome is the one that we mainly use for um, observing with eyes, eyes to eyepiece, visual observing. Um, it's great for looking at the planets, really nice sharp views of the planets. Uh, great for looking at the moon, great for looking at double stars. Um, that's a historic telescope. It was built in 1876 um, by the Grubb Optics uh, Company in Dublin, Ireland. And then it was purchased by Yale in 1882 to observe the transit of Venus. At that time, it was actually located at the Winchester Observatory, which was just a little bit up the hill, a little bit up the street at Edwards and Canner Street, where the Celentano School was. So that telescope used to live a block, a little more than a block that way. Um, and uh, then it was put in storage. So it was used for a while into the 1930s or so. It was put in storage. When we uh, got the uh, donation from the Leitner family to refurbish this building, that started in 2004 and then it opened in 2005. We got the telescope out, uh, cleaned it up, aligned the optics, painted it, polished it, <laughs> put it in that dome, new dome. So the refurbishment was really getting the telescope out of storage, having a dome for it, <laughs> getting the mount and the dome tuned up and everything and putting it in there. And actually, I was in there the other day. Um, actually, uh, the Yale mascot, Handsome Dan, <laughs> the bulldog, was here to do a photo shoot. And they did some photography uh, in the dome <laughs> with the telescope and also with this telescope. And um, I was noticing during the day, I, since we haven't had people here at the observatory doing labs or doing public observing, uh, really, we haven't done any maintenance or cleaning in the dome. I've done some more maintenance on this dome because I've been using it for remote observing. Um, so it's about time that we did a good cleaning and maintenance and polish the telescope and paint it since it's been uh, 15, 16 years uh, since we did that, since we installed everything. But to specifically answer your question, um, you know, there was no observatory here before 2004. So the refurb was that we got a nice historic telescope out of storage <laughs> and set it up uh, at this observatory on campus. We really didn't have a campus observatory before 
2005 when this observatory opened. There used to, actually, this telescope right here, this 12-inch telescope, used to be uh, in a dome over on the Pearson Sage parking garage, which was a terrible place for an observatory. It would, there were lights and it would vibrate and so forth. So we're very appreciative to Yale and Jim Leitner, <laughs> who gave the money to refurbish this building, put in the domes, uh, get everything started. And then uh, five years later, 2009, we opened the planetarium. So uh, again, with a grant from uh, Jim Leitner. Uh, oh, I guess another question. Fred uh, is asking, wasn't there another Yale Observatory in Bethany or Cheshire in the 70s or 80s? Yeah, so there was the Bethany Observatory uh, in the town of Bethany, right? About 15 minute drive north uh, west of, of New Haven. Um, that was a deal that Yale made with the town of Bethany uh, to use this very rural land for an observatory. And it was very active uh, in the 60s and well, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And at one point, there was a one meter telescope um, out there. Um, and then that one meter telescope was moved to uh, Chile, to South America, where it's still used there. Um, and there's a 20 inch telescope out there and a 10 inch refractor out there. And um, wasn't really useful for astronomy research uh, once Yale had access to uh, telescopes in Chile and Arizona and California and um, Hawaii. So uh, actually a lot of Yale astronomy research is done with the Keck observatories uh, in Hawaii and the five meter Palomar telescope, which is uh, near San Diego, uh, California. Um, so uh, Bethany wasn't really useful for research and it's a little bit too far away for doing student projects, for doing student research or for doing campus public outreach. Uh, there is or there was, I'm not sure if it's still happening, but there was public outreach events once a month run by the Astronomical Society of New Haven uh, out at Bethany. And that may still be active, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so let's see, what time is it? It's uh, 9, 9.15 roughly. I say I uh, want to go look at a few galaxies and see how they turn out. Uh, some galaxies maybe in Ursa Major and maybe over here in Virgo and maybe also the M3 cluster over the next 15-20 minutes. And then I think I'm going to go inside and warm up because it's uh, not cold out here, but it's not warm <laughs> either. I wouldn't mind having uh, like a little space heater <laughs> next to me. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move the telescope. And I think we're going to try to move to... Uh, so I think we're going to try to move to... M101, which is the Whirlpool, uh, or no, the pinwheel, the pinwheel galaxy. The M51 is the Whirlpool, and M101 is the pinwheel. So I think we'll try that. Now, the telescope is pointed over towards the moon over there. So it's going to point, uh, it's going to point at me and then turn and then point over there, right there. Okay, let's try it. Okay. All right, there it is over there. Let's command the telescope to move. There it goes. And I'm going to want to turn off the camera in its video, live video capture mode and switch over to the image accumulation mode where it will take an image and add it with the next and add it with the next and gradually build up a sharper, well, not sharper, but a, a, a brighter and brighter image. So switch to live stacking. Okay, so there goes the telescope. <laughs> you see it right next to me. I like being uh, <laughs> near the telescope, getting to see the telescope. Uh, <laughs> okay. All 
right, let me see if I can get the image software up. All right, I'm going to have to add that software. Okay. Okay, there it is. All right, so. it right there so you can see me and you can see the image as it comes down okay let's see how lucky we are <laughs> if we found the galaxy All right, so I'm gonna try a 10 second exposure I think a little bit windy so it's gonna shake around a little bit All right, I see, I see the galaxy. <laughs> it's up there. So let me see if I can get it centered a little bit better. And I'll explain, I'll explain what I'm looking at here and how I know that I'm looking at a galaxy. Um, <laughs> and I have to move the telescope. I think I need to move it uh, down. See if that's the right direction. I'm going to have to uh, take a new image. Yeah, so there's the there it is right there. That was the right direction. So let me keep moving a little bit further. I'm seeing a little fuzzy spot right in there. Okay, so we'll have to clear that. I, su I suppose I could show you what it's supposed to look like <laughs> um, in, a, in a professional image. Okay, I'm happy with how that's centered. So I am going to try to take some longer exposures here. Maybe 30 seconds. Okay. All right, let's wait for this image. It's not, it's not combining. It should be combining. Right, let me play around with the image that I have here so it's a little bit more clear what we're looking at. The, uh, I think I'm still actually just looking at the edge of the galaxy. I don't think I'm quite centered on the galaxy yet. I think this might be one of the uh, star, forming, star forming regions uh, in the galaxy. I'm not quite perfectly centered on it. I think the actual galaxy is a little bit off to the right still. So let me, uh, let me keep moving it over. Not an extremely bright galaxy. It's a big galaxy, though. It's what, uh, what's called a face-on spiral. There it is. There's the center of the galaxy. I thought that was the center of the galaxy. But uh, that's actually the nucleus, or the, not the nucleus, but the bulge, the central part of the galaxy that's the brightest part. So let's get that centered. Okay. 
a okay now let's start taking some long exposures here all right so hopefully this will be able to combine images because it's going to be a lot no, it's going to be a lot less noisy. You can see, kind of see all that background noise there. I'm going to uh, make the camera a little bit colder. That that will reduce the noise if you make the camera colder. So professional cameras will be cooled with liquid nitrogen or even liquid helium. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to do 30 second exposures. Thanks everyone for tuning in for the live stream tonight. Um, nice to have a nice clear night tonight, relatively clear. Get a nice view of the moon. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think for the rest of the session, for the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll just uh, get a better and better image of um, M101. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing here and try and make the image look good on the screen. So how many images do we have? Two, two images. It's not too windy right now, so hopefully we'll be, uh, hopefully I'll get a few combined images and save it and take a look at it a little bit later on. So we're looking here at this face-on spiral galaxy. And the central part right here is full of old stars, maybe a, a 10 to 100 billion old stars. Um, but the galaxy is a rotating disk and there's still hydrogen gas and helium gas out in the disk of the galaxy. And sometimes there are pressure waves that travel through the galaxy that make the gas compress. And when the gas compresses, you can have uh, a round of star formation where the cloud starts to collapse under its own weight and make new stars. So those younger stars are going to be brighter and hotter than the old stars that you see here in the central part of the galaxy. Uh, and because of the way the pressure wave travels in the disk of the galaxy, sometimes it will take a spiral pattern. It doesn't have to, but sometimes it does, and hence the name uh, spiral galaxies. Oh, looks like there was a satellite that went through one of my images. Uh, that will eventually get averaged out, but there's a little bit of a streak uh, right there. Let's try again adjusting the brightness of the I got a little bit oh there's the other part of the uh, there we go that's a little bit better there's the I just saw the other part so it was very slow moving so it's probably a satellite in fact it looked like it was uh, moving on a north-south line right so that would be um, either a weather satellite or a spy satellite <laughs> um, so with this galaxy The spiral arms will have those young, hot, luminous stars in them, which will appear bluish. And then the old stars are more in the central part of the galaxy. So the, here's the central part, the bulge of the galaxy. And I can see just a little bit of a spiral arm here, and a little bit of a spiral arm here, and a, a, a bit right here. I see some light pollution <laughs> over here. Um, and I see some dust spots on the lens, uh, not on the lens of the camera or of the telescope, but on the lens of the camera up here. So um, I can actually calibrate those out. I can do some uh, calibration images that will remove those, uh, those donuts, those dark areas right there. Um, so this image is going to gradually get, gradually get less noisy and we'll see a little bit more of the spiral alarms pop out against the background uh, light pollution of New Haven. Let's see. 
what I can kind of do is adjust the brightness of the image so that the sky looks darker and the image and the galaxy looks brighter, but it's diminishing returns <laughs> um, because of that gradient. I have to do some uh, uh, image processing using something like Photoshop uh, a little bit later on to get uh, the best quality image. But uh, this is looking pretty good. This is equivalent of a um, two and a half minute exposure as I've been sitting here taking images. Every 30 seconds it takes an image and combines it with the last set. So the last image that it took looked like that. And the combined image, uh, oops, uh, no. And the combined image looks like, uh, combined image looks like that. So as it sort of slowly accumulates light, we'll get a slightly better, slightly better uh, image. Nice. Uh, I think M81 last week looked a little bit better, but M101 uh, is a pretty cool galaxy as well. All right. Well, it's getting more cloudy, and it's still pretty chilly. Uh, and so I think I'm probably going to start to pack up, although I think I will calibrate these images uh, uh, so I can improve them a little bit later on and save them. Let me make sure I save them. <laughs> okay, there we go. Got it saved. And anyone have any last questions, comments? Thanks to everyone for watching. Um, so uh, you can uh, find out about the Leitner Observatory at our website, which is leitnerobservatory.org, uh, right? So um, put this in the chat for you, leitnerobservatory.org. Oh, I said leitnerobservatory.org. That's our old website, which will go to this website. But our new website is leitnerobservatory.yale.edu. So we're on the, the, the Yale web, web page system. My name's Michael Faison. I'm the observatory director. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the astronomy department. Um, so I teach classes here and I maintain the observatory and the planetarium. Looking forward to opening to the public again uh, this summer sometime. So if anyone has any questions about anything from public night or anything going on at the Leitner Observatory, anything about astronomy in general, uh, feel free to send me an email, michael.faison at el.edu. And uh, yeah. Oh, Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Uh, welcome. Uh, some of my students from uh, archaeoastronomy uh, class are here. Yeah, it's a pretty cool image. Um, we can do a little bit better with the big telescope in here, uh, the 16-inch telescope. This is a 12-inch telescope. We have a bigger telescope in here, which we use for student research projects, uh, advanced lab projects, uh, that kind of thing. All right. I will say good night and wish everyone a great weekend and uh, clear skies, and see you next time. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>